we unmute the microphones. Good morning, everyone. Oh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a beautiful morning indeed. Um, I just would love to welcome you all to this uh, conference. My name is Dr. Lesedi Mashumba. I am co-hosting this event with Dr. Khodisa Mogodi. Together, we are lecturers at the University of Botswana under the Department of Sociology. So before we move uh, to the next agenda items, um, we would like uh, to acknowledge that this conference uh, is organized by the Global Center of Special Methods for Urban Sustainability based in Technical University of Berlin, uh, Research Committee on Logic and Methodology uh, in Sociology, RC33, of the International uh, Sociology Association uh, in cooperation with the Research Network uh, on Quantitative Methods of the European uh, Sociology Association. We also have a directors that have been working on this conference as well. So the directors of the Global Center of Special Methods for Urban Sustainability include Professor uh, Nina Bauer, who is based in Germany. We also Funded by uh, the DAAD uh, with funds from the German Federal Ministry uh, of Economic Cooperation. As you can tell, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is on a global scale. This involves international partnerships, and this is quite innovative. Uh, you know, COVID-19 has brought us to times that are so unprecedented uh, that uh, we didn't even anticipate having a conference like this but with use of technology we are able to gather and move forward in research uh, and in academia so at this point i'd like to call uh dr hudisa mogodi to the stage to welcome our hod good morning ladies and gentlemen um all over the world and particularly here. May I start by welcoming the following uh, uh, dignitaries who are with us today. Um, we have the Acting Minister of Tertiary Education Research, Science and Technology, Honorable Machana Shamukuni. We have the Acting Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Tertiary Education, Re Research Science and Te Technology, Ms. Debohoba Hopi. We have the German Ambassador, Her Excellency, to, uh, German Ambassador to Botswana, Her Excellency, um, um, Mayor Helwig Bote. We also have the Vice Chancellor of the University of Botswana, uh, Professor David Norris, Directors of the Global Center of Spatial Methods for Urban Sustainability, Professor Nina Bau and Professor Angela Million from the Technical University of Berlin in Germany. 
And also may I recognize lead partners of the Global Center for Spatial Methods for Urban Sustainability, Professors um, Frey Fresh, Professors, uh, Professor Gaurav Raheja, and of course our very own Professor Gabriel Faimao, who is with us today. I bid you a very warm welcome. All protocol is observed. Thank you. Um, it is now my absolute pleasure to um, welcome to the stage the head of the Department of Sociology, Dr. Situnya Musime, to give us a few words of welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Musime. Thank you. Um, good morning to each and every one of you. And that is to be inclusive. Protocol has just been observed and I would like to reiterate the welcome that you've been given. Um, at this point, I'll we'll play a video that will speak louder than words on this department of sociology. I always get excited when I'm asked to talk about the University of Botswana, largely because it's an institution of higher learning that has really played a pivotal role in human capital development in this country. Actually, most of the public servants, those in the private sector, those in parastatals, I would say without doubt that almost 90% of them have been trained at the University of Botswana. Um, we are a comprehensive university offering all kinds of degrees from undergraduate level all the way to PhD level. Sociology at its foundation um, 200 years ago was thought as, and it remains to be that, the fourth and final science. It is really the connector, the, 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 the network between every science and every social science and every art subject with the people. There is no access, there is no possibility of world-class development, world-class education, um, relevant technologies without the contribution of sociology as a discipline and sociologists as professionals. Yes, sociology is it's, it's a diverse field. Um, having chosen, you know, juvenile delinquency has always been my interest, more so that uh, I have been a teacher for some time. So I have dealt with students and I have seen that, you know, delinquency in our schools has actually taken a, a, a different direction which needs to be addressed. I play multiple roles in the, in the program. First of all, I was very instrumental in its uh, creation. Uh, when I joined the department, there was only one person in the department who was a specialist criminologist, and I became the second person. At that time, the department was running a program at the, dip the diploma level, and the university decided to phase out diploma programs to introduce degree programs. So my colleague and I were very instrumental in the creation of the program from scratch. So we created the program and I naturally graduated from uh, coordinating the diploma in criminal justice to coordinating the degree in criminal justice studies. The most important piece of advice that uh, students require is relates to the requirements they need to fulfill and or uh, satisfy in order for them to graduate. You will realize that 
the university has what I propose to call a constitution in the form of the university calendar. That is the basic document that contains everything relating to the requirements each and every student in a particular program has to fulfill in order to graduate. One thing uh, uh, in this university that I'm proud of and students should be proud of in terms of resources is their library. This library is one of the best in Africa and uh, competes favorably with the first world libraries. The resources available there are massive. And I'm particularly proud of uh, our subject librarian, our current subject librarian, how supportive she is and how she would uh, personally invite us as lecturers to encourage our students to approach her in case they want some material and so forth. She will go to that extent. The graduate studies that we run um, in the department currently are three. We have a, a Master of Arts in Development Studies. We have a Master of Arts in Sociology. We have an MPhil PhD in Sociology. Yes, we currently have uh, 20 um, MA students. That is inclusive of MA Sociology and MA in Development Studies. And we are currently having 18 MPhil PhD students at various stages. And with the learning environment, um, it is good, it is interesting, and uh, one thing I can also highlight is that uh, the demands and the expectations by my supervisors are high, therefore it somehow puts pressure on me to make sure that I, I meet those demands and expectations and also uh, submit uh, on time the tasks that are given to me. The other very important uh, feature of the program is the internship. Uh, the students take the first three years in class learning theory, uh, learning uh, practical skills of being a graduate. But on the third year, at the end of the third year, they are sent on an attachment to criminal justice agencies around the country, mainly the courts, uh, the prisons, the police, that's where some of the students go. And this is a very important feature of the program because it allows students to appreciate the practical aspects of criminology. The vision for us as an institution is that we should be a center of excellence, not only locally, but globally. We really want to reach international standards. We want our presence to be felt in society. The key things for us are quality. Quality in the type of graduates that we produce. Quality in our teaching and learning. Service, that's the other fundamental thing. Service to humanity. Impact, how are we impacting lives with our academic activities. What we do, does it impact positively on somebody's livelihood out there? As a university, are we playing our role in stimulating the economy of this country? Those are the fundamental things for us as an institution. Are we having impact? Is our research solving real problems out there? The University of Botswana has a teaching and learning um, policy that is already designed to ensure that um, some of the outcomes of our education broadly, not just specifically to the Department of Sociology, are skill specific, um, soft skills, communication skills, research skills. So we are a really strongly soft skill based um, department. Um, besides the point that I've already made about the fact that a lot of the issues that we learn those skills, um, soft skills through, uh, also 
um, deeply theoretical, but also connected to lives as people know them, except they then learn more dynamics than they would have experienced um, at a personal level. So we have students that will get into every field. A sociologist will make, will be relevant in every field. Our students are getting absorbed in many areas, in the private sector, in the public sector, in the NGO sector. Some of them are coming back to, to teach at the university. We have students who are in very high positions in society um, all over uh, the, the, the Sadak region mainly, but uh, we also have had students from as far as field as North Africa, West Africa, East Africa, and the United States of America. So our students are making an impact, uh, and also there's evidence that our programs are really impacting on their uh, employability and um, also they are taking more responsibilities in wherever they are working. It's fundamentally important that the university is not just a local university. We must go out and our presence felt in the global village. That is why internationalization becomes very, very important for us. Not only should it be confined to student staff exchanges, but it's very, very important that we forge relationships, collaborations in terms of research with the best universities out there. Also, develop programs with those international partners, degree programs, co-create, redesign degree programs, academic offerings with the best out there. That is fundamentally important for us. The program also has an exchange program. Uh, some of the students who have graduated from the program uh, benefited from the exchange program between such universities as the Northern Ar Arizona University. Uh, the, the best of the students, the best of our students, uh, you know, they apply, compete with other students, and qualify. And between the University of Botswana and the Northern Arizona University, we have had about four students who went into that exchange program. You know, sociology in our own communities has always been un, um, un understood. So what is important is pursue sociology. It will take you far. And more so that it's not only about learning ab our, our societies, but it is also about molding us to becoming better individuals and also contributing positively in our own society. So I'll say to you at home, you know, pursue it. It will take you very far. We are here as a, as, a, as a department and as a university to ensure that students come to the university and, and get value for their money. But not only that, but also that they have a good experience or the magicolo experience as we affectionately uh, refer to our university. They have to get good experience. So uh, besides uh, familiarizing themselves with what we offer, they can also come to us before the register so that we can advise in terms of uh, their co the course offerings and also in terms of what um, the regulations require. The crux of the meta in sociology is developing communities and the connection between communities and the state and other partners in, in development from various um, standpoints, be it from policing, um, law and order, be it from health um, and access to health, um, indigenous knowledge systems. It can be about the media and how it links to um, development, how we link um, even politics to development. So we study the smaller structures that build together towards understanding of how individuals connect to a bigger ecosystem of knowledge and power. Uh, teaching has uh, taken a new dimension uh, with the advent of this uh, pandemic we now see a shift from classroom based teaching to the virtual type of, uh, of teaching 
uh, it is a relatively new arrangement it has its own uh, it has had its own challenges not surprisingly because it probably caught us by surprise sometimes uh, the, the 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 platforms are not working properly or they were uh, not uh, sufficiently anticipating this sudden uh, surge in the use and so forth and so forth but uh, we believe that now that we have come to appreciate that this pandemic will be with us for some time the university will also prepare itself the time is now that as the university of Botswana, we look at the problems that we have we are facing a pandemic right now and the pandemic has taught us one thing that we cannot afford to be waiting for others to find solutions for us that is why we are having this crisis in the developing country because we don't find solutions for ourselves we want somebody else to find solutions and sell to us i think COVID has taught us and we must learn from this COVID. in terms of expansions we are not expanding in terms of infrastructure or something like that what we are strengthening now is strengthening our research we want to be a research focused institution and therefore the transition and our efforts are on this transition from being a predominantly teaching and learning to a more research intensive university because knowledge economies means that the university must be research intensive innovative and importantly also entrepreneurial Once again, um, thank you. And once again, welcome. My task this morning is to was to introduce guests. Um, and I'll start by welcoming people that have been joining us online and even physically. We're in different time zones. So as the day progresses, um, different participants from around the world will be joining us at different times. So it may be important to repeat even that which we think has already been done. And once again, I'd like to introduce guests that we have here today at this official opening of this big day. Um, I have already been introduced as Dr. Musime, the head of the Department of Sociology. And we have among us the Acting Minister of Tertiary Education, Research, Science and Technology, Honorable Machana Shamuguni. We welcome you, sir. We also have among us the acting permanent secretary in the Ministry of Tertiary Education, Research, Science and Technology, Ms. Teboho Bahopi. We are also happy this morning to have with us the German ambassador to Botswana, Her Excellency Mafit Helwig Bot. And we've just seen him on the screen, our very own Vice Chancellor at the University of Botswana, Professor David Norris. We'll also like to acknowledge and welcome the directors of the Global Center of Special Methods for Urban Sustainability, Professor Nina Bawa and Professor Ing Angela Millian from the Technical University of Berlin in Germany. We also welcome the lead partners of the Global Center of Special Methods of Urban Sustainability, Professor Freya Fres in Brazil, Professor Dr. Guraf Raheja from India, and our very, very own Professor Gabriel Faimau here at the University of Botswana. Um, we welcome the, Botswana, the University of Botswana community. We welcome participants. We have among us presenters from 48 different countries. And at the last check, there was about 600 registered participants. So while we may be few in number in this room, um, there is 
counting going towards a thousand other people that are here with us this morning and that will be joining us at various points um would like to also acknowledge the presence of the media um the conference organizing committee from both the global north and the global south and to be very inclusive to welcome each and every one of you um, and ladies and gentlemen now i was going to blow continue to blow our own trumpet as the department of sociology while we are a very dynamic department we are seldom understood especially in the local industry as to what we um we can provide but that is improving very drastically especially in the last two years as we have aggressively um ventured into a journey of getting other departments and people around the region to know what this department offers and i can pr pr proudly say that the current enrollment of first years includes 20 uh, students from 27 different degree programs across the University of Botswana, the largest being students from the faculty of, interestingly, engineering and technology, um, because of the realization that the engineering and the technology is eventually to serve people. And without an understanding of the role of communities in the design of science and technology or engineering products and services, they may not achieve what the brains behind them intended to. We also have students, we attract students from accounting, entrepreneurship, business management, marketing, chemistry, geology, physics, biology, education, computing. So we're a broad-based support um, department for that connection between knowledge production and the communities that such knowledge production is intended to serve. Um, my colleagues on the video have already explained the programs that we have in this department and we are growing bigger each year. Now I'd like to end my introduction with a little story of how we came to be where we are today. It sounds more like a fairy tale. You know, the boy meets girl and they live happily ever after story. So in 2018, two complete strangers met on the academic social media platform, ResearchGate, and started chatting. Um, these two complete strangers were our very own Professor Gabriel Faimau and the director of the, 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 the Global Center for Special Methods of Urban Sustainability, Professor Nina Bauer. They didn't know each other. They met on social media or at least um, academic social media and they soon with their interaction realized that they had common areas of interest and they thought it would be great to work together to facilitate an exchange network of some sorts between german and african scholars um, but very quickly that idea grew to become a funding proposal that they were able to successfully um, find, find financing at the tune of, I think it's about 4 million Pula that has blown this project from a conversation between two people to a global south and global north uh, mutually productive um, conference and exchange opportunities that will span um, for the next four years. We're on the second year. We've already had a number of exchange pro, um, staff exchange programs and we have PhD students that are beneficiaries of this, this um, meeting of these two people. And so for the next three days, we will be really enjoying the rest of the story of what happened when these two complete strangers met. And with those few remarks, I'd like to thank you and welcome you to this conference. Okay, um, in fact, uh, just speaking of them, they are right behind me. Um, Professor Nina Bauer, can you please wave to the audience? Um, and 
We also have, and maybe they could introduce themselves. You know, technology allows us to, to do very interesting things that we ordinarily wouldn't be able to, to do. Hey, this is O.N. Professor Angela Million. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us. Yes, hello to everybody. It's been a pleasure and honor to have this opening ceremony of our conference. I'm very looking forward to. Thank you, Nina. And we also have Professor Freya among us from Brazil. Yeah, hello everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to welcome you all from Brazil. Uh, and thank you uh, also for the organization of this conference. Thank you. Uh, may you enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Dr. Musime. I would now like to welcome to the stage our very own uh, Vice Chancellor of the University of Botswana, Professor David Norris. the acting minister of tertiary education research science and technology honorable machana shamukani shamukuni i'm sorry or minister acting permanent secretary in the minister of tertiary education research science and technology the german ambassador to botswana your excellency ms halvek Borte, the deputy vice chancellors of the university of botswana who are here Directors of the Global Center of Special Methods for Heaven Sustainability, Professor Nina Bauer and Professor Angela Millen from the Technical University of Berlin, lead partners of the Global Center of Special uh, Methods for Heaven Sustainability, Professor Freya Fraser, Professor Gurav Raheja, and Professor Grebel Faimau. The scholars and distinguished conference participants that are here, the university community, the media, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed with great pleasure that I welcome you all to the first international and interdisciplinary conference of special methods for sustainable development. SMUS Botswana Conference offers a platform for scholars to interact with methodologists from various disciplines around the world and to deepen discussions with researchers from diverse methodological perspectives. Participants have been given an opportunity to organize presentations on methodological topics of their choices. Sharing their own research with an international audience and discuss the current problems with other scholars. We are very grateful to be hosting this very first SMUS virtual international conference. Our position as a university is to play a key role in human capital development in our country. And I believe this conference adds to this pivotal role. Our vision is to be a center of excellence not only locally, but globally. We want our presence to be felt in the society. These are the fundamental ideals we aspire to uphold. The constant question in our minds is, are we having input? Is our research solving real problems out there? It is fundamentally important that the university is not just a local institution. We must go out, have our presence felt in the global village. That is why internationalization 
becomes very important for us. It is, I believe, very important that we forge relationships, form collaborations in terms of research, build partnership, co-create, redesign degree programs with the stakeholders and in collaboration with the best universities and institutions out there. The collaboration between the UB Department of Sociology and the Technical University of Berlin in Germany is the way to go in facilitating exchange of knowledge among scholars from all over the world. And I really wish to commend and applaud the efforts of the Department of Sociology. I must also indicate that universities are being called upon to take a leading role in the realization of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I want to believe that the discussions that will ensue in this conference will contribute towards advancing the achievement of some of these goals, particularly the Sustainable Development Goal number 11 of the Agenda 2030, which seeks to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. I have been reliably informed that we are fortunate to have the support of a great cadre of sponsors for this conference. I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development through the Dad Exceed program. Higher education, the, the, the directors, <clears throat> I want to thank the directors of the Global Center of Special Methods for Sustainability, Professors Nina Bauer and Angela Million, together with the SMUS lead partners, Professor Gurav Rahija, Professor Freya Fraser, and Professor Grebel Faimau, who is also a sociology professor at the University of Botswana. Let me also acknowledge the hard work of the SMUS Botswana Organizing Committee members, SMUS project team, and all the volunteers. You have really worked hard, worked tirelessly to ensure that this conference is a success. And I really want to believe that it will be a success. This three days conference will indeed be your hard work in display. To the session organizations, to the organizers, to the presenters and all atten attendees, I wish you an eventful and most engaging experience throughout the conference. Indeed, I appreciate the presence of Her Excellency Helvig Botte for blessing this conference and getting first-hand information on the University of Botswana relationships with the rest of the world. And I hope to continue working with you beyond this conference. Great German, we would like to have great German institutions setting up shop at the University of Botswana and tapping on the great talent of our students. I also want to thank heartily the Acting Minister of Tertiary Education, Research Science and Technology, Honorable Shamukuni, your support is giving us a lot of courage, sir. It reinforces the commitment of your ministry uh, to support higher education, and most importantly, to support research, development, and innovation. For that, honorable minister, we're very grateful. With these few words, I wish you fruitful discussions and warm virtual stay in Botswana. Thank you. Yes, good morning again. Um, may I please observe the following uh, colleagues, dignitaries from the Ministry of Tertiary Education, Research, Science and Technology. We have the DPS, Mr. Opa Masisani. 
another masisani. We have the coordinator policy, Dr. Madusa Mine. Thank you. And we, all, we also have the Deputy Permanent Secretary, Mr. Ronald Puke. Oh, and also um, Nina is on the screen right now. Okay, excellent. So um, before we continue with our program, we have another video to share with you um, before I introduce our German ambassador to Botswana. Thank you. Imagine a world of limitless opportunities, a world that exposes you to your true potential, a place where no doors close and the key to your prosperity lies unswervingly within. Established from the brows and sweat of a great generation of times of yore, from the true spirit of Kopano and Bichaupo, the University of Botswana, an institution in pursuit of excellence. Madikolo, the mother of all schools, is strategically positioned in the heart of Khaboroni, the country's capital city. UB serves as Botswana's only comprehensive institute of higher learning where Tutoketebe resonates with the scholarly teaching and learning workforce. The University of Botswana boasts of at least 125 undergraduate programs and 98 master's and doctorate graduate qualifications, housed in eight distinguished faculties that are reputable for production of extraordinarily high-quality, competent graduates in the global human capital market. Our academic qualifications are internationally recognized, and a successful completion of a UB certificate guarantees instant recognition anywhere in the world. The eight faculties are Faculty of Social Sciences, Faculty of Engineering and Technology, of Health Sciences, Faculty of Education, of Humanities, Faculty of Science, and School of Medicine. The admission into any of the faculties and courses in the university follows a strict cultivated culture of admittance by academic merit, experience, and qualification. The Human Resources Development Council credits the University of Botswana as a leading contributor of meaningful research output nationally, contributing significantly to policy development and providing sound professional consultancy to government and private sector. The ORI, Ogavango Research Institute, Center for Scientific Research, Indigenous Knowledge and Innovation, Clean Energy Research Center, Botswana Transport Technology Transfer Unit, and the SEN Research Center are some of the research divisions of the university, outputting unparalleled quality data and research of national, regional, continental, and international significance. With top-tier learning infrastructure and facilities, fit for its world-class scholars and alumni, UB harbors commodious conference facilities convenient for multifarious corporate and academic uses. Teaching in this academic hulk takes place in highly specialized, optimally resourced, and technologically equipped smart classrooms and laboratories. The Circuit de Milemasira Teaching Hospital and the school's library, rated as one of Africa's giant fountains of knowledge, supports student acquisition of market-ready skills. For your refreshment and housing, the Graduate Village bargains decent accommodation with two refectories at your disposal and well-furnished hostel blocks in various points of the university. In the Sports and Culture Department, University of Botswana is not wanting its Olympic-sized swimming pool, UB Stadium, the Aquatic Center, and the Campus Indoor Sports Center, which house the 2017 Netball World Youth Cup, affords you an astonishing recreational experience worthy to write home about. Indeed, you are home away from home. Right. Thank you very much for that um, interesting video. Once more, we can see that the University of Botswana is growing in leaps and bounds in all sorts of directions, providing programs that are relevant locally, uh, regionally, and also internationally. Um, at this point, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Professor Nina Barr, uh, who's gonna wave to us now. Nina. Hello, Nina everybody. Nina. 
I'm very look for forward looking much. It's like we thank a lot to the German, um, German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development for and the DRAD for funding this conference. And also a lot of thanks for um, the research committee for research and logic and methodology RC33 of the International Sociology Association, as well as um, the research network um, for quantitative research um, of the European so Sociology Association for co-organizing co this conference for us, um, which as everybody probably knows is a conference of the, of the first international conference of the Global Center for Spatial Methods of Urban System Sustainability. And we are really happy for um, that Botswana is organizing this for us. The only thing we're sad about is that we can't all of, of us be there in person. So all the most thanks to you organizing this despite uh, be, uh, despite the hassle of um, the pandemic and all the hardship you had to suffer. Thanks a lot in the name of the whole um, lead team, as you see, like um, Gaurav Rajeva, then Freya Frese, um, Angela Miguel, and of course, the star of the show, um, Gabriel Fremont. Um, he's in the audience. I've seen him, so he cannot be shown on screen, but you will see him later when we're giving the introductory um, lecture. He's done most of the work of organizing this, so a special thanks to Gabriel for doing all this. Thank you. And also recognizing Professor Raheja, Professor Rahita, would you like to say a few words? Yes, uh, good morning from India and very pleased to be part of this event and true greetings to Professor Gabriel Pramu, the dignitaries in the audience there and a wholehearted welcome from the GCSMOS team to the participants all over the world. I think this is the first one. So I think first, but not the last. So I would say it's beginning virtually but it's beginning with a great impact and I wish everyone great success and we hope to see you further in person as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor. Now I'm going to introduce our special guest, um, the German ambassador to Botswana, um, Mayor Margit helwig Bote. Can I just say something that you said, Madam, upon assuming duty in this country last year? You said Botswana and Germany are partners in many fields, also in developing a highly skilled workforce through vocational training, skilling young people, fostering talent, creativity and entrepreneurship are the way forward for Botswana and its population. With that, may I please welcome you, um, uh, Madam Ambassador, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, the Honorable Minister of Tertiary Education, Machana Shamukuni, uh, and the PS, David Norris, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Botswana, and all the distinguished heads of department, Professor Gabriel Feimau of the University of Botswana, Professor Nina Bauer and Angela Million from Technical University Berlin, Professor Freya Frese from the University of Sao Paulo, Professor Gaura Fraheja from the Indian Institute of Technology in Roorkee, distinguished guests, scholars, lecturers, students, good morning, Bumelang, bom dia, guten Morgen, and namaste. I feel actually honored and privileged to be here to speak at the opening ceremony of the first international and interdisciplinary conference on spatial methods for urban sustainability, as it will be attended by 200 distinguished scholars from four continents and 48 different countries. I think that is quite something what you put together here. And um, let me also say, that it's actually a bit intimidating for me to be here um, because 
I'm nothing but a diplomat and a civil servant. I did not pursue any academic career apart from graduating from university. So it's a bit intimidating to be surrounded by so many scholars and by so much academic expertise. So I'm only a simple person. Um, I have traveled the world a bit and seen a couple of things with my own eyes. I lived and worked in a number of African countries, in India, in Germany, and some other European countries. So I have seen bits and pieces of three continents of the four continents you cover in your project. So I would like to share some observations uh, and ideas on living and working in cities, but also on life in the villages and in the rural area, because we often tend to forget that both belong together in Botswana, as well as in Germany and uh, in India. I will not talk about Brazil because I have never been there. So Professor Fraser, forgive me for that. Let me give you some figures, first of all. Four years ago in 2018, 13% of the population on the African continent was living in cities. This number is going to rise and by 2050, we are expecting 22% of people living in the cities on the African continent. And that means in the next 20 to 30 years, between 23 and 33 million people could be on the move and go to live in the cities. So there is good reason to implement the sustainable development goal number 11. Professor Norris quoted it already. And you, if I got it right, you want to introduce social science methods into urban planning, planning and policy making. So for me, I said I'm a simple person. This means you want to put human beings first. You want to look into the needs of human being when you look into planning cities like houses, workspaces, hospitals, uh, schools, markets, roads, flyovers, malls. So whatever you do, it has to be in the interest of the human beings, human settlements for human beings. That's how it should be. But we all know that very often this is not. I lived in Bangalore in South India for four years, and it's a city of 13 million people where crossing the street is something like survival of the fittest. And the constant noise of cars and two wheelers and tuk tuks uh, and whatever vehicle uh, you can think of makes you sleepless. And you can experience a constant stress level if you are not used to this. But I think. It will never be possible to downsize mega cities uh, in Asia uh, and Africa again, because they are just too attractive on people in terms of jobs and lifestyle. Cities are centers of growth and progress. They have better internet connectivity. They have more liquor shops. They have better schools, easier access uh, to water and electricity than the rural areas. But why don't we make more efforts to make the villages more attractive for people so that they stay and the cities are less congested? Isn't that something social scientists and urban planners should take into consideration as well? Botswana has vast rural areas, remote places with small villages and few people who struggle to find a job. There are cattle posts, tough living conditions, so a lot of back and forth between villages and cities is occurring uh, in Botswana. In India, life in rural areas is very tough. So there are millions and millions of migrant workers in India who leave, especially the northern part of the country, to go to the south to find a job there. And in India, even though life in the rural areas is less tough, there is a lack of public transport, there are no interesting jobs, there is no fast internet connections and fewer job opportunities. And that means the younger people, they all go to the cities and the older generation is left behind. But there is also a dependence of the cities on the rural areas, for example, on, for food production. At least in India and in Germany, that is the case. In Botswana, where a lot of food is imported from South Africa, it may be less uh, of a point, but at least the much-loved beef is produced locally. 
How do city planners take this into account? How do they plan for fast and reliable transport, transport of goods, transport corridors? Maybe the COVID crisis was something like a wake up call for all of us because it has disrupted transport. It has made access to goods, also food, more difficult. So that was the case in a huge country like India, but also between Botswana and the neighboring countries, especially South Africa. And most important, cities also depend on the rural areas for their drinking water. In Germany, we've been hardly thinking about this because water was always there. There was no shortage of it, but now we experience less rain, maybe not so much this year because it rained a lot, but at least higher temperatures. Climate change is everywhere now, so we may experience uh, water shortages in Germany as well. So, by the way, in my house in Germany, we collect the rainwater to water the garden with it. And I have installed a similar system at the German residence uh, here in Khaburone. In Botswana, and I did so because I know in Botswana, water is a constant issue. So I think people in Khaburone are happy when they see that Khaburone Dam is full uh, and uh, Limpopo River is doing well. In Bangalore, in India, it was the Kovari River which provided the water for the 13 million inhabitants of the city. But it also provided the water for the farmers in the rural area. So there was a constant dispute between farming, watering the crops and drinking water for the people. So this is something which needs to be addressed. And uh, if I may quote another example from India in the Rajasthan, a desert-like area in India, people have special ways uh, of having water catchments to collect rainwater. So how do the city planners take all this into account? What attention do they give to water management and uh, collecting rainwater? I think there are plenty of examples to learn from each other. And I think this conference is a good example that uh, the global north can learn from the global south. For a long, long time, it was all, we, we all in the north, we always pretended it was the other way around. But um, as somebody who has lived uh, actually longer in countries of the global south, uh, in the north, I can tell you that uh, there is time to reverse it. And there is time to learn from the south in all our countries based uh, in, uh, in the northern hemisphere. I'm saying this because I think Climate change, which is everywhere, can be felt in countries like Botswana, can be felt in countries like India uh, very, very much. We're also feeling it in Germany now, but we're getting there only now. Last but not least, let me also make a point on regional integration. It's not really an issue for India because the country is basically like a continent, but uh, Khaburone hosts the secretariat uh, of the uh, SADC, the Southern African Development Community, and the country is well connected with its neighbors and it can benefit economically. So the same is true for Germany. We have been a member of the European Union since 1958 and we benefited economically. So. EU and regional integration has become like part of the German national identity. It may not yet be the case with SADEC, but uh, I think um, you can be on the way to get there, especially now that the SADEC secretariat uh, is headed uh, by um, a Botswana. When you look at the development and planning of cities and rural areas from the angle of regional integration, I think it should be a case in point because it may open new and bigger perspectives. From an economic perspective, it's not only useful to do away with borders, with customs, with non-tariff trade barriers, it's also useful to look at bigger markets and consumer groups for better internet connectivity, for fiber net access, for digitization, for electricity, for water, and maybe even for medical services. That could be planned from a regional perspective as well, especially in areas here in Botswana, which are close to South Africa.
So why not share more within a region for the benefit of the people? In Germany, we are doing this with neighboring countries, uh, with the neighboring regions of France, the Netherlands, Poland, Austria. So I have mentioned uh, SADEC. Germany um, is a great fan and big supporter of SADEC. Um, and we're doing this not because we just want to support an institution, but we want to do it for the benefit of the people. And I think it's quite impressive to know that 1.8 million people in the region, in Botswana, in Lesotho, Eswatini, South Africa, Namibia, and you name them, have access to better and, and, and clean water thanks to these projects. Ladies and gentlemen, it was said already, the German government uh, through uh, the AAD, the German Academic Exchange Service and the EXCEED program um, is funding the Global Center of Spatial Methods for Urban Sustainability based at the Technical University in Berlin. And I think my government is doing the right thing because what I have seen from just like one hour into this conference, I think it's really impressive what you have put together here at the University of Botswana. I know that COVID has considerably slowed down the project, but I think it's just great that you're starting now. You're starting with a conference series, and I hope that very soon there will be exchanges, student exchanges and exchanges between scholars uh, as well. The aim of this whole operation is to learn from each other. And I really like the story of how Professor Feimau and uh, Professor Bauer met on the internet and developed a project. Um, of course, the COVID crisis has taught all of us new methods of interacting through digital tools. So let's use them. That's what we're doing now. But digital conference will never be like direct interaction of people, like meeting with real human beings. So let's not forget we are all social animals. So at one moment in time, we really need the interaction with people. But the good thing is, thanks to the digital tools, we can be connected in real time across continents and we travel less. And that tells us that we consume less fuel, we save the planet, and we are able to interact nevertheless, provided that we have good internet. So, ladies and gentlemen, with these few remarks, let me wish you an interesting conference, um, fruitful deliberations, and I hope that you will produce concrete and action-oriented ideas for cities and for rural areas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, our beloved ambassador. We are going to watch uh, a video that's just going to play on the screen now. Twenty-two degrees south and twenty-four degrees north of the southern hemisphere resides a 2.3 million plus populated desert and tourism terminus boasting of Africa's busiest aviation center. This is the Republic of Botswana, the diamond trade miniature giant of Africa. Dumela, wamukelesirile mo Botswana. Hello, welcome to Botswana. Authoritatively declared a sovereign state in 1966 by the Queen's Empire, 81 years after a delegate of four and their translators, the three Dukhosi and William Charles Willoughby brazenly braved foreign waters above the RMS Tantalan Castle to seek total declaration of the Republic's borders as a colony. Botswana rose from one of the poorest African economies to a phoenix of the black continent, repeatedly rising against all odds and surviving in its rise a tumultuous, pugnacious neighborhood. Led by the University of Botswana, 
The first public institute of higher learning and the country's biggest academic institution by size, capacity, quality and quantity, Botswana's education system is reinforced by the presence of 15 tertiary education institutions, namely the University of Botswana, Botswana University of Agriculture and Natural Resources, Botswana International University of Science and Technology, Botswana Accountancy College, Botswana Open University, Limkunkwe University of Creative Technology, Awil College, Boti University, Baisaho University, Professional Studies, Institute of Development and Management, AMB University College, New Era College of Arts and Technology, Buitikanelo College, and Khabarone Universal College of Law and Professional Studies. A nation without a past is a lost nation. And a people without a past is a people without a soul. The iconic words of the founding father of modern-day Botswana, the first prime minister and first president, His Excellency Se Seretse Huisi Bing Mapiri Kama. Founded and deeply rooted in the foundations of the multicultural Setswana culture and the Setswana language, Botswana is home to over 20 tribes and ethnic groups evenly distributed across its territories. Despite a great transformation in its cultural heritage, the indigenous occupants of the landlocked shining diamond of Africa continue to maintain the true building values of our forefathers. Both Botswirir, Butwele Butloko, and other morals that build today's societies. The dynamic dress and food culture of the home tribes is also a wonder of the world. From the colorful cow horn women heads of the Ova Herero and Ova Banderu, with their flow length Ohorokova gowns borrowed from German missionaries of the 19th century, to the watery dresses of the bamboo kushu and the animal skin robes of the Basar. The Botswana tribes have adopted distinct dress codes and staple foods. Fish, mopani worms, wild berries coupled with pounded maize or sorghum form the basic staple foods of the majority of Botswana tribes who are mostly subsistence farmers. Thanks to industrialization and globalization, Botswana farming dynamics are now graduating into commercial and professional farming. Priding itself as a beacon of democracy, the Botswana constitution is hospitable to the true ideals of a concrete democracy, forming a tolerant multi-party state that has since independence held free and fair elections on schedule. Transition of power in Botswana has also remained exemplary, with each vacating president willingly and voluntarily evacuating citizenry number one to their successor. The judicial, legislative, and the executive branches of government are the oiled engines of the country's driving mechanism, ensuring chronic adherence to constitution, respect for its citizens, international treaties, and policies. The general political landscape of the Southern African state defines the truest meanings of the words free, fair, just, and non-oppressive with human liberties as enshrined and empowered by the penal code of the state, freely exercised without prejudice and censorship. Botswana, the world's destination of choice. Welcome and good stay. Mo ki Botswana. Pula. Thank you very much. I take it we have enjoyed uh, our videos. Uh, they were well crafted uh, and we are really appreciating our media team for putting together these uh, lovely videos. Um, I am very excited, ladies and gentlemen, to call to the stage uh, our Honorable uh, Acting Minister of Research and Tertiary Education, uh, Research Science and Technology, to the stage, uh, Honorable Machana Shamuguni. And may I say, because we are here, 
uh, as uh, due to the power of education. We can all agree with me that perhaps we all grew up in small villages where we were from, isn't it? And we are here today, we are um, holders of significant positions in government. And this is because we have a government or uh, a ministry that uh, is tailored towards improving education, ensuring that we are empowered uh, as people, as children, and ensuring that we actually do have access to the key to a better life, which is education, isn't it? Thank you very much. May I call to the stage our Honorable Minister. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Thank you, Director of Proceedings. The Acting Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Tertiary Education, Research, Science and Technology, Mr. Bogobahobi. Your Excellency, the Ambassador of the Republic of Germany to Botswana, Helwig Bote, Ambassadors and High Commissioners, Vice Chancellor of the University of Botswana, Professor David Norris, Directors of the Global Center of Special Methods for Urban Sustainability, Professor Nina Bao, and Professor Angela Millen from TU Berlin, Germany, the lead partners of the Global Center of Special Methods for Urban Sustainability, Professor Fryer from Brazil and Professor Gaurav Raheja from India and Professor Gabriel Faimau from the University of Botswana. The Deputy Vice Chancellors of the University, the University of Botswana community, scholars and distinguished conference participants, the media, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure and honor for me to be part of the first International and Interdisciplinary Conference on Special Methods for Urban Sustainability. I extend a warm, a warm welcome to scholars and conference participants from different parts of the world. I am particularly happy that this conference is hosted virtually by our country, Botswana. Of course, through the University of Botswana in partnership with the Technical University of Berlin in Germany. It is my sincere hope that in the future, you will have another on-site conference so that you can come and visit our beautiful country, Botswana. This conference gives you a special opportunity and occasion for you to present your research and follow the research trends in your fields of interest. As we all know, research plays a vital role in our daily lives. This is evidenced by the influence it plays in transforming, in informing transformative policies implemented by governments all over the world. We cannot overemphasize the significance of research in propelling humanity forward. Research is fueled by curiosity as we ask questions and immerse ourselves in discovering everything there is to know. Learning is thriving. Without curiosity and research, progress would slow to a halt. And our lives, as we know them, we would be completely different. Everything we learn, Director of Ceremonies, equips us for future challenges. The search for knowledge and hard facts is even relevant now as the world is evolving. Director of Ceremonies, as we go about building this body of knowledge, this body of knowledge is even more crucial as we must ensure that we produce evidence-based, reliable, and, and accurate knowledge. We must ensure 
that we use equivalent methodology, methodological approaches as the global south and the global north to produce research that informs transformational policies that will promote sustainability for our communities. The efforts of the University of Botswana in partnership with the Technical University of Berlin to start a global network of methodologies, scholars, experts from various disciplines from the global south and the global north to embark on social science methodology discourse to help scholars gain knowledge through interaction with each other is indeed outstanding and commendable. To find new information, to test and substantiate cru crucial findings, to investigate phenomenon in order to discover cause and effect on people's lives and to formulate new approaches to solve emerging problems facing humanity needs a blueprint to guide in making sure fitting solutions, for the solutions are explored and found. Methodology becomes that blueprint, a guide that focuses and shapes the attention of methodologies to produce knowledge that will be relevant for generations to come. It is also the foundation on which to build new knowledge. Therefore, we must collaborate to eliminate the knowledge deficit that exists between the methodologies and scholars of Global South and Global North. By doing so, we guarantee common and applicatory methods to both the North and the South. This will certainly result in impeccable solutions. Additionally, also there are common perplexities facing the world. The approach to dealing with them cannot be the same because of the varying context in which they are occurring. It is thus important, Director of Ceremonies, that as we work together to find solutions, we take into account and develop context-based methodology that will help researchers to produce context-based solutions to the many global issues that are prevalent today. The mission of sustainable development goals as agreed upon member states of the UN is to ensure sustainable future for all. This is attainable by collaborative efforts such as this one. Most of that research for production, research or production of new knowledge is key in development of societies. The 17 goals, which are currently under implementation by member states, Botswana included, need to be approached with new research methodological approaches in order to produce the desired results by 2030. And that is exactly what this partnership is intending to accomplish. The focus of special methods for urban sustainability on goal 11, sustainable cities and communities of sustainable development goals is particularly to develop transdisciplinary special methods, which will help build sustainable cities and communities through research-based efforts. Botswana's effort to achieve this goal has encompassed sustainable environment in its vision for 2036, which calls for the transformation of Botswana's human settlements to be sustainable by the year 2036. I therefore urge governments, including the government of Botswana, to support initiatives such as this one, which exists to find solutions to global issues. We cannot support such initiatives through partnership in policymaking as well as continued discourse on way of approaching issues with a common spirit. What did I say? We can support such initiatives through partnerships in policymaking, as well as continued discourse on ways of approaching global issues with a common spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, it is good that the conference comes at a time such as this one, a time of advancement in various sectors of the global economy. In Botswana, 
we are constantly adapting and learning new ways to do things, adopting innovative solutions for experts across fields. Your Excellency Ambassador Helwig Bote, Vice Chancellor Professor David Norris, I am elated to see that the SMUS conference theme is in line with Botswana's vision of sustainable economic development, which seeks to advance the country as a knowledge-based economy by 2036. Botswana is steadily rising to the occasion as critical thinkers, creators, and innovators are empowering their communities and embracing a new age where knowledge defines our intentions, plans, and strategies. A more pleasurable conclusion is the realization that collaboration between the Global South and the Global North through this conference will facilitate knowledge expansion and foster knowledge exchange between the two collaborators. I want to believe this will not be the first and the last SMUS research methodology conference that will be held in Botswana, Prof, because it is through such meeting avenues that we form the basis for future bigger and better collaborations. Knowledge is becoming a major source around the world today. Hence, Botswana has recently begun to beat the knowledge economy drum much more louder, indicating that we are committed to becoming a knowledge society and be part of the global knowledge economy. This realization has driven Botswana to make major changes to our education system. One in particular is to produce a workforce empowered with the requisite skills to generate new knowledge in offering practical solutions to problems. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very much confident that indeed SM, SMUS conference has come to pave way for the accomplishment of this huge mandate for our country. Any country which seeks to become part of the globalized knowledge economy must produce a new generation of knowledge experts or knowledge workers. I therefore urge Botswana, especially the young people, the youth, to attend the conference and learn from renowned scholars and methodologies to be able to make meaningful contributions considering this call. To every attendee in this conference, there are still millions of things that are yet to be discovered. Therapies for the world's pandemics and species to discover. All of this is possible with research. SMUS Conference Botswana is here to provide you with vast knowledge. Be open to learn. Ladies and gentlemen, I therefore encourage you to network relevantly and extend your hand of collaboration to other scholars so as to significantly contribute towards research and innovation and to help the world at large find solutions. Director of Ceremonies, Your Excellency Ambassador Helwig Bote, the Vice Chancellor Professor David Norris, as I conclude, let me congratulate you for a well-planned conference that addresses the core needs of our nation in seeking knowledge. I wish you all a very successful conference and hope that you will achieve the intended objectives of this important meeting of scholars. It is now my singular honor to declare this conference officially open. I thank you for your kind attention.
Uh, indeed, I thank all our esteemed guests who have uh, shared with us their understanding of why we are here today and also in terms of their experiences um, as leaders within the tertiary education sector. Um, we are on time, I'm pleased to say. Uh, and um, what I'm going to do now is ask um, my colleague to uh, advise us on uh, the break that is just about to start and uh, what is to happen during the break. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mamogodi. Um, thank you to every speaker who have graced us with uh, their presence today. We are indeed uh, honored uh, to have you here today. And indeed, this is evident uh, that we are moving towards the right direction. And I like that the minister, uh, the acting minister mentioned that indeed we need to be finding fitting solutions uh, when we are faced with times like this. And and here we are trying uh, due to COVID-19 to focus on virtual capacity building. And it has come through nicely. It's working out really good. And we appreciate everyone that has made this morning a success. Um, so for the break, which we are going uh, to go into next, uh, there is tea at the front as you go out of uh, the front door. And uh, let's try and be back for those that are remaining at 10.15 uh, so that we are ready to sit and um, uh, proceed with the proceedings of the day. Please note that we are going to be using the same link that we are using now for the official opening. So the official ceremony uh, or opening ceremony is not um, done yet, or we are still going to use the same link uh, that we have used. And after the break, we'll therefore have the opening lecture, as you can see on your programs, and uh, uh, there will be two of those. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let's reconvene at 10.15. Just one more little announcement. Our esteemed guests, um, we will, we've got some refreshments arranged for you. You will be taken to the, to the room. Thank you very much.
Hi everyone. Are we? Um, um, are you guys there? Ich bin hier. <laughs> du weißt, dass wir aufgenommen werden, ne? Sorry. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome back from uh, your break. I hope you have uh, been refreshed. Uh, you had a little bit of time uh, to take some coffee or have something to bite. So we are moving forward on our program and now we are looking at opening lectures. And uh, there is two of them, but we are starting with uh, lecture one, which is on decolonizing social science methodology and cross-cultural research. Uh, and it's going to be uh, presented on by Professor Gabriel Farmau and Nina Bauer. And as you guys already know, they are um, the, the, the organizing team, the major, the back of this conference. And I'm sure you still remember the story that our HOD told about how they met on uh, ResearchGate, which is an online uh, platform for researchers. And uh, let me leave uh, the presentation to them. And uh, Rafael Mao, the stage is yours. Uh, Nina, I hope you are ready. Okay, good morning colleagues. And let me acknowledge uh, colleagues around the world who have joined us online. And it is really a pleasure for us in Botswana to host the first conference. We are done with the opening ceremony. I think it was a beautiful one. Now we are getting to the main menu of the conference with the opening lectures and later on the keynote and our sessions and we'll have the second day tomorrow and the third day on Saturday. Nina and I we are going to give an opening lecture here but our focus will be on giving a broad overview of the SMOOS project and the philosophy that underpins the project itself. So although it is an opening lecture, but our focus will be on giving a broad overview of the SMOOS project and what we'd like to achieve at the end of the project. So when we discuss the idea of SMOOS, we talk about collaboration between scholars from Global South and Global North. And we think 
you know, to proceed with this idea of collaboration, we need a kind of philosophy that gives foundation to the cooperation. And we think about decolonial, decolonial approach that may give us some ideas as to how we can develop the program or the project. In the past few decades, decoloniality has been at the center of academic discussion as it is considered a political and epistemological movement, as well as a way of thinking, knowing and doing as expressed by our keynote speaker, who will be talking to us later, Professor Ntlofu Gatsin. At the heart of the coloniality project is an attempt to develop an analytical approach to interrogate the notion that Western epistemology and modes of thinking are universal. Interrogating this notion in our view is crucial as it is believed that coloniality exists as an embedded, and I quote, as an embedded logic that enforces control, domination and exploitation disguised in the language of salvation, progress, modernization, and being good for everyone. That's from Professor Mignolo, 2005, page six. Different phrases such as epistemic disobedience and epistemic reconstruction have been used by the colonial scholars to characterize that the coloniality project and how it problematizes the hegemonic Eurocentric modernity, knowledge system and systemic view of power. As a point of departure, the colonial approach values a public recognition and how knowledge and methods of knowledge production were developed through colonial interpretation of knowledge system. Any analysis of the coloniality, however, cannot escape from two fundamental questions. The first one, what alternative epistemologies does the colonial project offer? Second, whose interests are served by the colonial analytical approach? Our focus on this opening lecture is not about responding directly to these questions, but rather outlining the problem and value of the coloniality as well as the place of smooth project in the context of the decolonial approach. One of the key issues of decoloniality that requires clarification is the problem of pragmatic understanding of decoloniality. Here, there are at least three broad viewpoints. The first viewpoint can be characterized as an ideological view of the coloniality. This view is based on a position that colonial domination does not only shape and influence our ideas of race, class, gender, and culture. It also involves, and I quote, epistemicide, the matter of knowledge. I quote it from Santos, 2014. As suggested by Santos 2014, epistemicide implies the death of knowledge as a result of unequal encounter and exchanges among cultures. And the death of knowledge implies the death of socio-cultural groups who possessed it. In this context, the task of decoloniality is about dismantling Western epistemology and Eurocentric understanding of the world and monopoly of knowledge system interpretation, or as suggested by Maldonado Torres 2011, decoloniality refers to the dismantling of relations of power and conception of knowledge that foment the reproduction of racial, 
gender and geopolitical hierarchies that came into being or found new and more powerful forms of expression in the modern or colonial world. While maintaining a resistance of the Western epistemological uh, domination and acknowledging the problem of colonial history, the second viewpoint favors an epistemic reconstruction that involves, and I quote from Cuyano, the reconstruction of a critical imaginary and the rebuilding of a new horizon of future. The reconstruction process involves acknowledgement that colonial history is not the only history that shapes the knowledge system. Other histories and historical processes also play a critical role in the production of knowledge. The idea of reconstruction, however, is often criticized as a model that does not provide a real critical option. According to Mignolo 2014, reconstruction is a manifestation of the imperial expansion of Western thinking, as it only leaves two options, being assimilated to the variants of Western modernity or reconstructing categories of thoughts from one's local and particular tradition. The third few points adds a conversational or relational tone to the coloniality. Among others, Boaventura de Sousa Santos has called for an epistemic diversity of the world with intercultural translation. And other scholars, such as Ali Megji, has advocated for a decolonial spirit that rejects hierarchical view of knowledge systems in favor of collaboration and conversation. While acknowledging the, the damage that the colonial power has done, this viewpoint embraces the position that decolonizing is not about diminishing a certain mode of knowledge production or epistemological approach, it is about broadening the area of conversation and intercultural relationship that allows for a cultural encounter and knowledge exchange. Or as argued by Megji, decolonizing does not necessitate a dismantling of Northern theory, but rather involves a horizontal reflective and conversational approach. Uh, at this juncture, I would like to invite Nina Bauer, you know, to respond to what I have presented by saying something about assumptions and how we redefine the problem relating to the coloniality. Nina, mm -hmm. over to you. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, before we come back to the smooth program, we want to um, um, discuss some of the fa false assumptions that underlie this, pro um, um, this discourse. First, let me say that this is not about um, denying colonial history or the crimes that have been conducted in the past, but it's more about that we believe as um, to us, um, academia is about discourse and um, relating to each other in the, um, in the world. Um, we find it more productive also looking at possible connections, possible ways of relating. So, um, one of the false assumptions is that, interestingly, if you look at the um, um, decolonizing debate, while it um, um, advocates for diversity, at the same time, it, um, um, it replicates the monolithic assumptions um, of unities of culture, which you can even see in words like Eurocentrism, the West, and the Global North. Um, if you look at what is usually really meant is the um, epistemic culture that is typical for um, academic discourses in the American Ivy League um, 
um, universities as well as Oxbridge in the United Kingdom, which is a very specific part of um, Euro um, European culture, which is epistemologically um, important um, because in these cultures very often um, still um, 18th and 19th century debates on positivism and constructivism are raging on. If you look at the global north itself, like the global south, you can observe a variety of epistemic cultures um, with very different um, 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 different um, culture, different um, epidem epistemics, both in everyday life, um, but also between disciplines and between schools of thought. Just to give you an example, like um, my own country, Germany, um, up to um, 200 years ago, there were over 1,000 um, different um, states and cultures. And up to today, you can find a lot of regional differences um, represented in the Sandburg, for example, by Angela and myself, um, one of whom has been socialized in, in the former East, East Germany and the other one in former West Germany. But also, there's a lot of regional variation. There's also a lot of variation in culture and cu um, culture and language. Um, and the same goes through if you embed um, Germany in a wider European context. Um, it also means that um, there is not only um, a center periphery structure and power related parallel relations between the global north and the global south, um, but also within the global north. And it opens up questions for assumption, like, for example, do countries like um, Australia really belong epistemically to the global south, or do they also, in some ways, like concerning power relations, should be they more be counted, um, counted to the global north? What about countries like Singapore? which are from a very different cultural background, but um, um, economically are one of the richest countries in the world and so on. This is important for the discussion about epistemology, um, like the first false or some second one is that you can see in a lot of these assumptions while they make a claim for history, they have in fact a very static view of history or the history of thought. At least in the continental European philosophy of science, positivism has been outdated for almost 200 years. And actually, for example, for German sociology, criticizing positivism was one of the founding elements um, of German sociology, which is also has been also over 100 years ago. Within um, the so-called Western tradition, you can find many divergent epistemological schools which have very different claims. What is important for our context is that not all of them, but on many of them can be easily linked, for example, to African epistemologies. Um, an example would be sociology of knowledge, which again is a relatively old approach. In Germany in the 1930s, there had been debates which are very similar to the debates on African ep and epistemologies about indigenous epistemologies. Basically, one of the claims is that any kind of knowledge, including scientific knowledge, is based in everyday life, which always means that the way we do science is always rooted from the culture we come from. Our point is that um, instead of fighting against outdated ways of thinking that probably a lot of scholars don't share about it, not all, not, not all but most of us, it might be more productive um, jumping right to the most current debates and trying to relate them. For example, an example would be Hubert Knoblauch's communicative constructivism, which has um, an, um, a philosophy, um, includes a philosophy of thought, which is very um, similar to the um, African epistemological approaches that we've been um, we're going to hear later on in the conference. Um, a final assumption that we find that sometimes to a European reader, um, it always looks that there is sort of some um, assumption that um, European scholars, for example, are all knowing and ignoring colleagues from the global north on, um, um, on purpose. Now, from our everyday life experience, the, the contrary is true. Like, for example, in RC33, the Research Committee um, um, of Logic and Methodology in Science, um, we, um, most members are not only willing to go into dialogue, but they think it is as absolutely necessary exactly because epistemologies and methodologies cannot necessarily be transferred to other parts of the world regions. We just didn't have any points of meeting colleagues and building colleagues. So we have... Um, um, we have faced 
also practical issues with communicating with scholars from the global uh, south. For example, we don't have meeting points of conferences. Um, also, we don't have uh, have no access to writings in a lot of um, German libraries, which are usually well stocked. There's almost no books from um, scholars from Africa, um, and. If we don't get access to the books, how are we going to have access to discourse? So the point is not denying the experience of um, hardship and um, discrimination and also the historical legacy from the global so uh, south, but also stressing that as many, many uh, power relations and difficulties there are, there's also um, a lot of ways for building relationships and building dialogue. Um, and they tend to be covered in the discourse and decoloniality. Now, one of the major assumptions is that in the center, we want to stress the possibilities of relating and linking. Um, I'm going therefore now to hand over to Gabriel again, who's going to talk about how um, decolonial reflexivity uh, will link to the SMOOTH program. Okay, thank you, Nina. Uh, we have given a sort of broad context by discussing at least, you know, a few points relating to the coloniality. And how do we bring in the smooth project into this context? Uh, I have presented those few points. And of course, while each viewpoint offers a value, we, as we try to develop the smooth project, we suggest what we can call decolonial reflexivity. One of my colleagues in the department, Dr. Mo Cody, she likes talking about reflexivity when she advises students. So we want to adopt the idea of decolonial reflexivity as a strategic positioning in understanding decoloniality, particularly in the context of the relationship between the global south and the global north. The term decolonial reflexivity mirrors the notion of postcolonial reflectivity introduced by North Year's 2020 to characterize an ability to recognize the negative contribution of the news industry to representational other. Decolonial reflexivity refers to acknowledging the colonial epistemology that dominates the interpretation of knowledge systems and produces a structure of authority that governs knowledge production to set a conversational arena for mutual exchanges among various epistemologies that reflect particularities of different societies. If the logic of coloniality is underpinned by the binary opposition, where one is considered superior and the other inferior, the colonial reflexivity follows the proposition that reason manifests in different cultures. Culture as, cultures as spaces and places of thinking. As such, the task of thinking, theorizing, or reasoning is not exclusive to a particular culture as it is universal in nature. The colonial reflexivity therefore is informed by three key principles that have been discussed by many decolonial scholars. That is first, ecologies of knowledge, pluriversality and interculturality. Introduced by Santos, the phrase ecologies of knowledge refers to the recognition of the different ways of knowing by which people across human globe provide meaning to their existence and understanding of the world. I quote it from Professor Antlofogatseni, 2019. Pluriversality signifies a vision of coexistence and cooperation of many worlds in a pluriverse. As such, the argument of decoloniality must at the same time work to wrestle decoloniality from the temptation of totalitarian totality. Decoloniality promotes pluriversality as a universal option 
which means that should be universal is in fact pluriversal and not a single totality. I quote it from Mignolo and Walsh, 2018. And the third principle, interculturality is not simply about dialogue or encounter between cultures. As suggested by Mignolo and Walsh, interculturality is about building new different societies with structural ordering, socio-political and cultural transformation. In this context of epistemology, interculturality informs how we develop the project. I will move on uh, towards you know, the overall concept of smooths. As I said, smooths is an initiative for global cooperation between scholars from global south and global north. The smooths project brings together 48 partners from 47 countries and eight world regions. As we can see uh, on the map, we have scholars from nearly all over the world, from our continent, Africa, from South America, from Europe, and from Asia. Next, please, next slide. Okay, in terms of, again, part of our concept. First, we think about improving our methodology. That will include improving methodological skills for scholars, including our PhD candidates. We improve methods that will help gaining access to international research community and improve our different research practices. At the same time, we contextualize and decolonize methodology by taking epistemologies of the global south seriously. And for the global south, adapting methodologies to local context, and if needed, developing our own methodologies that better suited the local epistemologies and the needs of our different societies. And part of the concept, we would like to link research and teaching. Obviously, this is the key point that we all have been uh, discussing, but by, by coming up with the idea of Smooth Project, we want to come up with different ideas and projects relating to how we actually link our research and teaching, or in short, how our research informs our teaching or how our teaching benefits from our research. The next one, we also discuss this many times in the context of Botswana on how we link theory and practice. Therefore, at a later stage, we'll talk about how we actually put this into practice by developing a strong collaboration between scholars and also those in the field or practitioners like policymakers. Then to inform the whole concept, we thought of a thematic focus that actually bring all the ideas together. And we believe SDG number 11, that is about social, economic, and ecological sustainability of cities and communities should bind us together in this journey of SME, SMUS. And I believe our colleagues, uh, Gaurav and Angela, will talk about this uh, in the second part of the lecture. Okay, the smooth actions follows the principle of the five E's. The first one that is education and what we are doing today that is part of number one. So we build a global methodological network by organizing, 
different conferences like the first conference we are having at the moment with a basic idea that the conferences will bring together scholars from all over the world from different fields. The second one that is experience, it is about gaining applicable skills in research through combining teaching and research courses. So this is another action or another uh, plan that we'll be having in Botswana this year. The third one, evaluate. That is about reflecting on methods via writing a PhD thesis and developing project proposals for postdoctoral research. And my colleagues, uh, Gaurav and Angela will touch on this. Then number four, it is about gain uh, exchange, gaining skills, applicable skills in practice through practical empirical implementations. And the last one, enhance, where we develop workshops by bridging the gap between research and practitioners or research and professional work. Um, let me just give you an example of how we are going to implement uh, the project by talking about action two, that is experience gaining the applicable skills in research through combining teaching and research and different courses. You know, an initiative that we would like to implement in Botswana this year. Okay, challenges that we would like to address in action two, in the context of Global North, we identify lack of ethnographic experience with possibly very distinct cultures, especially from the Global South. Also lack of experience with lack of teaching infrastructures. For example, power failures, no internet, no computers, and so on. In the context of Global South, high workload for teaching and lack of research time funding opportunities, lack of ethnographic experience with possibly very distinct cultures, and also as a result of post-colonial university structures, lack of ethnographic experience with our own cultures. Overall, we think of assumptions like social scientists want to write and publish, also training of university staff as Invest, a sort of investment in our next generation and answering difficult questions generally requires collaboration. And collaboration in our view will improve future career chances. Uh, I will speed up a bit given that we are running a bit uh, out of time, I'll proceed. Okay, our target group that will be university teaching staff, which means we'll combine, we'll develop, you know, kind of co-taught courses where we have the host that will be, you know, the home lecturer. And we have scholars from a network partner university from, it might be from the same continent or different continent. And as this application aims at building close uh, long-term contacts, the courses will ideally consist of three steps. So the first one, partners will meet at TU Berlin for up to three months, you know, to develop some research idea. Then the partners will meet at the host university for four to eight weeks in order to co-teach the course and also collect data. And the next one, the third one, Partners will meet again at T. Wellin for up to three months in order to evaluate or to examine what we have done and plan for publishing results from the research. Okay, so this will be um, a sort of model that we will adopt in terms of combining teaching and research. So we'll have the step one, planning and brainstorming. 
Then we have the actual co-teaching and exchange. And obviously the last one will be the, out up, uh, the output of the initiative. And a very uh, brief example from Action One Education about building a global methodological network through conferences like what we are doing uh, today and in the next three days. We identify challenges such as these. From the global north, strong methodological infrastructure or strong international methodological network. But in some cases, lack discourse with colleagues from the global south. From the global south, we have sort of lack of funding opportunities, less systematic methodological training, lack of methodolog methodological discourses, and lack of access to international networks like conferences or publication in open access journals. So overall, we think about the possibility of lack of collaboration and epistemologists from the global south are not included in global methodological uh, discourses and research as a whole becomes worse than it could be. We propose that we build global methodological network through conferences. So therefore, we plan for annual joint conferences. For example, today we are having the first international and interdisciplinary conference on special methods for urban sustainability in cooperation with ACID 33 and RN21. So as we schedule this year, we have it in Botswana. This is the first conference. Next year, it will be in Brazil. The following year, 2023, it will be in India. And 2024, hopefully it will come back to Botswana. I am just saying it because we are going to have an open call in 2022. So the main concept is about inclusion. Therefore, our conferences will be free of charge, meaning no conference fees for the presenters and the participants. We also offer travel funding for scholars from the global south to attend or to participate in the conferences. And one scholarship per SMUS partner university. Then 25 within region travel scholarships. So this is what we're offering in, in the context of the program. And we also uh, sent out open calls for session organizers and papers. So the concept of seven day conference, unfortunately, uh, we don't have uh, on-site conference. Therefore, we, you know, the way we organize it is slightly different, but the concept is that we would have PhD workshops that will be one day. For this year, we'll have it as part of action two. Then the second one, advanced methods training. Again, we are going to have in the context of Botswana, we'll have it in October. Then we organize three-day conferences that will be organizing sessions, papers, and also networking. And smooth day, we had it yesterday, that is general assembly, networking, and social programs. I'll give it over to Nina for, I think we are running out of time. I'll give it over to my colleague, Nina, will present the last part that will be about how we organize sessions for the conferences we are having in the context of SMUS initiative. Over to you, Nina. Thank you. This is both to um, introduce the concept of you of this conference, but also to invite you the call for the Brazil conference a call for session organizers will start in November also to organize it if you haven't been part of this conference, please be invited. Um, to participate in the next one. We purposefully adopted the RC33 statutes because um, they're about inclusion. 
So basically, um, the general rule is we're talking about methodological problems, which could be anything from qualitative, quantitative research to epistemology. Um, and thanks to the um, um, German Ministry of Cooperation, who is funding this conference uh, by the DRID, we can afford not to ask for conference fees, which is a big barrier. So everybody only has to cover their own travel expenses. But um, what Gabriel already said, at least for the members of the um, of Smooth, there is um, travel funding available. A second one is that in, um, in international discourse, we, uh, we need a common language. And on a world scale, these would be either English or Chinese. And we opted for English. Because if you count in not only the number of native speakers, but the countries where English is one of the um, official languages, it is the predominant language of science in the world. And in a way, it's a little bit of fair, um, unfair to everybody, so it starts getting fairer. What is more important is like that we have um, sessions should have speakers from at least um, two countries. Um, and there's open calls for session organizers and abstracts, and everybody gets equal time. So again, like for the session organizers, please make, please make sure that everybody gets their, gets their fair share of time. So these are the practical um, rules for session organizing. And we can already say um, the conference is um, a success, despite being on, um, on, online. Please note that um, I put up the link for um, Book of Abstracts. In the Book of Abstracts, you will see the schedule Zoom, um, um, uh, Zoom links and the abstracts of the single papers and sessions. Um, and the first concept we had, um, we made a choice we made that we will have keynotes both from the global um, south and the global north. And a, sec um, um, a second aspect is that while usually on methodology conferences you have uh, discussions on qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods, and in recent years there have been also more discussions about methods like in specific research fields like food studies, um, digitalization, and so on. What is new for this program? Program, which just happened because uh, we got these kind of streams that we have a whole stream on decolonizing cross cultural research directly relating to our talk, and a second stream on transdisciplinary research and design based methods, which Angela are and, um, and Gabriel are going to talk about in a, um, in a session. And also in each session, speakers from various world regions are present, which is also very rare for international conferences. Finally, we're really happy about the participants. Um, as of yesterday evening, we had 580 participants. Um, for comparison, at RC3 con um, 33 conferences in Europe, we have between three and 500 participants. And in the first RC33 regional conference in Asia had about 100 to about 150 participants. So this is actually for first conference, this is quite a good number. Finally, and this is the conclusion of the talk, um, as you can see, we put a lot of design on the overall structure of the conference, but we also believe that we have to start it practicing decoloniality in everyday academic practice, which means reflecting about what we're doing and changing also not only the big things, but also the little things. Just to give you some examples how we tried to implement this um, in the conference program as a starting point, and we do believe that it is important to start reflecting about it. The first one is it is important to us that you do not want to build separate networks, but intermingle in order to facilitate dialogue. You will see already this re re represented in our keynotes that you purposely in both keynotes make mixed um, mixed both the genders and the um, um, and um, speakers in each talk from the global north and the global south. A second one that we notice it is a lot about is about visibility. Who starts speaking? Who is second to speak and who responds? As you will have you seen, we purposefully um, decided that Gabriel would do the start and I will do the respondent to reverse, this, um, reverse, reverse the, the order. Who gets how much of the speaking time? Who speaks and who listens and so on. You will not only see this reflected in these um, opening lectures, but also um, in the keynotes. 
We are very happy that we have keynote speakers, both from, um, um, from that Global South, namely because this is a conference taking place in Africa, of um, um, speakers from African origins um, and um, content, um, German language scholars. You can also see that we purposely sort of build, try to build in order that they sort of, um, the keynotes swap in order so there can be a dialogue, a dialogue over the keynotes. Finally, in the program we organized is the program like this, like after this opening lectures, there will be keynotes and then we have four streams. Um, while you can jump between the streams, if you follow one stream, we all try to organize it in the world way, building the sessions that um, if you follow the discussion, a discussion has the option to build. We, of course, don't know if this will work because we haven't heard the papers yet, but at least from the abstracts we got, um, we try to organize in, the way, in a way that um, we can have some meaning, meaningful um, follow-up de uh, follow debates. Please have a look in the program that much. Just for giving you an example on how we did this, as this is the talk, opening lecture on decolonization. Um, as you can see, I, Gabriel and I are doing the opening, then um, Sabelo Nudoli Gacheni is talking about decolonization as methods. And then we purposefully started with uh, a debate on um, how to overcome like um, alternative epistemological approaches to positivism and constructivism offered in the global now in the north and then continue discussing about African epistemologies because we believe um, they will relate um, on the first um, um, on the first debate um, and it's better to, to, uh, discuss, um, to understand the later discussion if you know a little bit about the early one. Then uh, on, um, tomorrow, Wolfgang Aschauer uh, from Austria is going to talk about classical quantitative cross-cultural research. Um, and the stream um, on decolonization is continuing asking about feminist methodologies before, to, uh, um, before we swap over to Bacheli Chilisa talking about the indigenous research methods in Africa. And then we will have a whole session critically reflecting her approach, both reflecting to this and hopefully relating to the earlier discourses before we swap back to an um, um, international approach about discourse analysis and sociology of knowledge, which I mentioned earlier. Um, on Saturday, we will um, continue to discuss about how, to, how this apply, um, 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 relates to macro micro approaches um, and investigating tra spatial transformation uh, processes. Before we come back to a keynote by Gabriele Rosenthal, who is a German, but who's done most of her empirical research in, we um, in Western Sub-Sahara Africa um, and um, still speak about biographical research. Um, and then we will um, end with a final discussion in this stream before we go down to the, close the closing lecture. And you will see like, um, the, um, the, uh, the last member of the core team of the center is Freya Frese, who will give the closing lecture talking about um, spatiality and spatial research in Brazil, and therefore linking the discussion in this conferences to next year's conference in Brazil. So this is the overall program, and um, I thank you a lot for listening. listening. I will hand over to um, Gabriel and Freya now, and also, um, unless we don't see, don't see each other in, um, um, anymore. Please have a wonderful conference. We're happy that you're joining and enjoy. Um, bye to everybody and thank a lot. And uh, actually also Gabriel again, thanks a lot to you and the Botswana team for organizing this and making this hop, um, possible for us. We know how much work it is. Okay, thank you very much uh, colleagues. That is an, intro, an overview to the SMOOTH project. I believe all of us, we are now in the project, hopefully we'll have some fruits as a result of the project in the next few years. Offer to you, Director of Ceremony.
Hello again. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professors uh, Bauer and Faimau, for that uh, very comprehensive uh, lecture on the focus of our three-day conference. Uh, I do think that we must go ahead with the lecture two, um, and then we may be able to take a few discussions immediately after. So let me welcome um, Professor Raheja and Millian, um, who will be talking about transdisciplinary research and design-based methods. Thank you very much. Welcome. Yes, thank you very much for having us. And um, we were also asked to give you a long-term vision of the Global Center of Spatial Methods for Urban Sustainability from the perspective uh, of the planners, designers, and architects that are also part of the team. At the same time, we were asked to focusing on methods in transdisciplinary research, including design-based methods, uh, these uh, methods that are at heart with our very much more applied disciplines. Um, and um, next slide, Gorov is basically assisting me. I will... Uh, start and then he will take over the second part of this short lecture. And as we heard this morning already, um, urban planning, urban design, architecture, the structure of a city is an issue of our regions, is an issue on the world scale. But uh, in the global south, where most of the world population lives, it is often still of a a severe problem um, and it was illustrated quite well that over the past decades and this process is still going on uh, more and more immigrants from rural reason, regions um, come to cities drive urbanization there and cities themselves uh, are still utterly in need to be designed to be planned for such an amount of inhabitants and to me the situation resembles at times uh, uh, of the 19th century Europe when industrialization fueled a very rapid urbanization of cities like Berlin, where I'm based, with an overall lack of appropriate housing and basic infrastructure back then. But going back to today, yes, living conditions of millions of urban inhabitants may have improved since uh, United Nations UN conferences on human settlements in Vancouver and in Istanbul, as well as the establishment of the Millennium Development Goals in 2000, um, in the year 2000. But we also know, and here I'm quoting uh, the United Nations paper, the persistence of multiple forms of poverty growing inequality and environmental degradation remain enough among the major obstacles to sustainable development worldwide. And with social and economic exclusion and spatial segregation, often an irrefutable reality in cities and human settlements exist. And uh, reading this and seeing the bluish highlighted issue, it is therefore unsurprising that when bringing disciplines um, of social science and more applied science like urban planning, urban design, traffic planning, um, but also civil engineering, water engineering together, that this is a very international interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary um, task and needs approaches as well in, re in research as also in application. And this brings me to the next slide showing the disciplinary background of smooth partners. And as you can see, we have colleagues from psychology, anthropology, history, geography, uh, besides colleagues from sociology, um, but, and we have landscape architects, we have transportation planners, civil engineers, water engineering, and uh, just the bluest ones are the ones that Gorv and me are representing here right now, although we have more members from these disciplines in the networks from architecture, urban design, and urban planning. And also, and this is something that I really want to stress for this conference, is that uh, 
also the presentations you're about to see, the papers that are going to be presented come from these different disciplines, which I think is a great success already. Next slide. Um, of um, today and now, um, our lecture has three parts. I will continue on the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and how researching from a more applied lens, what does it mean? And keep in mind, I'm talking a lot about urban planning and design, but I think a lot of things that I'm referring also um, uh, is um, relying or uh, uh, is also referring to other applied disciplines. Um, and I will hand over to my colleague uh, Gaurav uh, from India, who will then shed a light on the transdisciplinary research, its challenges, and will give examples that somewhat also stand what we are looking for in our network of a potential to bring the world of academic, the knowledge of methods, of uh, the knowledge also of create empirical evidence together with the uh, uh, practitioners that are more on the implementation side. While I also have to stress even for my person, even for Gorov persons that uh, within our disciplines and our teaching, we never only could be academics. We always have to be also applied uh, in our thinking and in our active. So we always also engaged into practice, which also brings challenges uh, for our everyday life as professors in universities. Um, the, um, I started off with showing that how the sustainable development goals um, provide a somewhat I would say interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, as well as a global dimension for applied scientists, for practitioners uh, in urban planning and urban development. Uh, it reflects somehow a planning objective that reaches beyond the scale of communities, cities, region, and even the nation state. And um, one example um, uh, of these um, uh, sustainable development goals, uh, they are for some how provide an overacting or overarching uh, pro, uh, prospective guidance for what we do in practice and research. Um, and for us in the uh, Global Center, in the SMOOTH uh, um, partnership, the sustainable development goals uh, somewhat um, are very relevant. And as mentioned already, the sustainable development goal 11 is somehow a starting lens for us. Um, and and this uh, sustainable development goal uh, 11 is about making cities more inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And according to this development goal, urban policies and planning approaches so should effectively tackle the challenge, these challenges of inclusion, resilience, and safety in cities. And uh, the next slide shows, and I, I really want to stress this, um, that by tackling SDG, 11 within our global center as a starting point for research and for practice, um, it cannot be seen stand alone. Um, the SDGs are interconnected. And uh, to me, um, the visual representation you see as a circle, and here I'm maybe also talking as an engineer, it gets unstable or even will collapse if you take one part out of this structure. So if we talk about more sustainable cities, yes, of course, you have to deal with aspects like water security, food security, uh, renewable energy, and so on. And this again brings this disciplinary connection um, to many other um, disciplines and their uh, activities in research and practice. The next slide. Nevertheless, um, the, relating to the objectives of SDG 11 uh, and to my starting comment, um, it is about minimizing the urbanization development impacts and maximizing socioeconomic values of the urban environment. And both have strong relationships um, with their spatial, social, cultural, economic, and even environmental characteristics, of course. And to us, the urban space itself mirrors the spatial knowledge of people 
in the way they use, appropriate or modify space. And based on this local knowledge, uh, it turns to be out that it is an in integral part of the production of policies and designs that need to be context sensitive and context responsive when promoting urban sustainability. Nevertheless, um, there is also our perspective as, and role as researchers and experts, as academics and practitioners, being at times not local, having our own perspective um, of what we see and find. And um, we did a workshop with our smooth PhDs. We had 12 scholars in Berlin getting prepared. No, we had more. We had 30 um, scholars, 10 more online, so in total 40 PhD smooth scholars uh, getting started in their PhD work and we had 30 on site um, and we did a workshop in an abandoned airport building in Berlin. Um, the students have various uh, disciplinary background and um, this building is unique. It used to be the largest building structure of the world when it was finished in the 1930s. Is It's now empty, abandoned, looking for future use. And we gave the students uh, paintings and asked them to take a photo inspired by the content of composition of the painting. And um, next slide. And this was a photo taken by one group. And as you may wonder or speculate, if this photo was done inspired by the coloring of the painting we gave them, of the spatial setup, um, of the imagination that maybe some travelers were indeed filled with tremendous sadness leaving Berlin. We don't know. We may end up uh, in finding the right interpretation, but maybe we also end up in the trap of importing or exporting our expertise and per perspectives to research or practice solutions that do not fit best. And um, this is, by the way, one example how art-based um, methods can, can somehow also inspire our analysis or analytical thinking or sharp our analytical thinking. And David Pierce and his colleagues, um, Anil Makadania and Evid Babir, discuss such traps of importing and exporting sustainability in their book on uh, bl uh, called Blueprint for a Green Economy. And they give examples very much more referring uh, to the topic of sustainability, uh, like transferring pollution or contamination activities between context on, or naming under evaluated purchase of natural resources as examples. And traps like that need to be paid attention to, and this is also one aim of our center to do so. Next. So as an intermediate conclusion, um, we as applied disciplines uh, are very much increasingly aware that in order to achieve, for example, SDG 11, there cannot be overarching, overriding formulatic uh, solutions. Instead, we also uh, have to also to circumvent uh, traps as depicted before, uh, before, require strategy that are joined, merging from knowledge transfer, exchange and implementation are multidimensional, conflating a variety of disciplines that go way beyond applied sciences and expertise and methods and context responsive solution highlighting local knowledge and speciality of contextual circumstances. And we're looking for iterative processes, learning from experiences, not only being in our ivory towers of university, but also going out into the field, asking ourselves, what does our research mean for implementation? What does implementation need from research? What methods are they looking for? What methods is practice basically offering us for research? Gaurav will talk about that in a bit. And, um, at the end, I also have to stress that we are currently faced a challenge that for a long time, applied scientists, planners, designers in practice, we have favored normative and design-based methods and less on empirical methods. By the way, there is a shift in the 1560s. It was a lot more quantitative driven. Planning was a lot more quantitative driven, at least in the German context. 
And at the same time, in the past two decades, we also have observed a growing emphasis on evidence-based policies and practice. And um, it is argued um, that um, uh, evidence-based policy making, planning and design should inform urban development scheme, while this is also subject of criticism and revision, then evidence is also mistaken for undisputable, for not for, for being scientific and objective, which is a pipe dream we all know. We know from social science mythology that empirical findings are strongly influenced by researchers' social position, as already highlighted by Nina and Gabriel before. So um, we are looking basically for something to get out of the underpinning dictum, which often statistical procedures are maybe putting forefront, but not always, I have to stress, but this dictum of it worked there that it will work here. And we, we know this is not as simple or intuitive as it seems at first sight. And um, it is almost impossible to construct objective data or even harder to empirical establish a causal relationship. So we are back at the issue whether the exact same methods could be universally applied. And uh, we also challenged our um, PhD scholars in Berlin to have these um, um, uh, to look for these uh, dissimilarities between contexts to make basically the in, in, in incorrible or incomparable comparable um, and um, such comparing processes can be maybe expired by this exercise and results we're showing here and here the um, students were giving a painting by Caspar David Friedrich from the early 19th century and they came up uh, with a lens to position themselves in, in a speciality of an abandoned airport and airfield maybe seeing the asset and beauty of an open an airfield in the middle of a large city. Uh, so to conclude, and uh, an aim of our center is to provide evidence-based urban development, to foster evidence-based urban development, to bring knowledge transfer exchange and implementation together. We have actions dedicated to that called practical empirical implementation. My colleague, I'm sure my colleague um, Freya Faze in her concluding lecture will refer to some of the uh, knowledge that is being produced there and is aimed to be a pilot for more uh, these of this kind of practical empirical implementations to come and to be financed through our center in the next years. We also uh, provided uh, the production or, or funding for the production of massive open online courses where um, applied scientists, uh, but also um, social scientists together with practitioners, also at times policymakers, bring their knowledge together and provide teaching content and um, also discussing a research agenda, so bringing back their knowledge to the smooth centers to be building upon. And I'm handing over to um, Gaurav, who will now talk about this quest of doing uh, transdisciplinary research. Thank you, Angela. Uh, I hope I am audible. Uh, can you confirm that? Okay. <laughs> Fine, so thank you so much, uh, Angela, for uh, providing this base for this conversation already, as has been said by you. I think in, in the extension to this, all I can say is, um, I also represent the regions of Global South coming from India, and also the discipline with co-sharing with uh, Angela. And I would say the very fact that we are all representing different disciplines, different regions itself is a testimonial to the fact how transdisciplinary research as a project can bring all of us together on this day. In fact, that itself is an evidence of transdisciplinary thinking and carrying forward on that in the, in the terms of what this reference from Lang says is that there is an emerging agreement uh, because all of us are right now concerned about sustainability, but maybe none of us has one single view on sustainability which can provide global conversions because 
the issue of localism is still what, what makes it very critical for us to understand how decision makings, how knowledge production and what research methods also work and apply in a certain context. Uh, whether we talk about ethnography, whether we talk about tactile methods of urbanism, I think the context also determines that kind of a research uh, direction that we all need to take up. So going back into this factor, you understand that one key aspect of sustainability science, therefore, is the involvement of actors from outside academia into the research process. This is perhaps what our action five and action four resonate under the smooths uh, and talk about bringing people and wider set of stakeholders from decision makers to policy makers to even practitioners of an urban goal, wherein the academics and the research groups can interact with them. And there is a shared knowledge that kind of goes into strengthening the system for a better sustainable experience which can in fact, as it says, to integrate the best available knowledge, reconcile the values and preferences, and as well as create ownership for problems and solutions that we're talking about. So as I think very rightly put up by the German ambassador, I couldn't appreciate more that whatever she could also communicate to us as a large community was coming from an experienced knowledge, which perhaps was a lived experience and is now being able to resonate with the challenges that the world is witnessing, whether she mentioned about the challenge of water and collecting the roof water. And I'm remembering uh, Angela's production on roof water farmhouse as an example, and how you saw an example of a lay person talking and demonstrating about that because nothing speaks better than a live example in the world of practice. So if you see in terms of challenges that the transdisciplinary research faces, uh, there are of course a variety of them, the list is not exhausted. But to just highlight a couple of them, I would say one is the conflicting methodological standards. There are points when which same data can be interpreted and viewed very distinctly by virtue of two disciplinary opinions. On the same side, it can perhaps manifest on one side a better knowledge, a critical opinion, on the other side, it can also lead to indecision in certain projects. Second aspect, if you see, is the lack of integration across various typologies of knowledge structures and community, communicative styles. <clears throat> each knowledge pattern, each uh, discipline, perhaps, uh, also uh, has, has its own background of its own structures of production, own protocols that need to be followed. And I think that's where, again, the project of GCS moves becomes very vital because we are talking about this exchange so that the young researchers of the future generations can be trained with those cross-disciplinary approaches. And that's how what could make things better integrated. The other aspect, if you see, is, is there is some kind of fear of failure. Uh, on one side, we see uh, data and projections that happen. And every research, as you know, starts with an assumption. There could be a hypothesis, there could be a premise on the basis of which one needs to uh, ensure that the outcomes are in, in line with that hypothesis to kind of provide a, a positivist approach. But eventually there is an intense fear of failure that happens in the domain of practicing projects because the question is, <clears throat> how are these projects going to be evaluated? Who evaluates that we have succeeded in practice in an urban transformation or not? Who, who evaluates that our streets have become safer for women or not? And who evaluates that access to water and sanitation has reached its, its pinnacle point of equity? And how do we ensure all these things? Perhaps there are immense failure examples of how policies fail, how things fail. And eventually one could attribute to the fact it is somewhere a methodological rigor which has either been avoided that leads to such kind of failure. And I believe these are opportunities we can look back into them and look at more legitimacy of transdisciplinary outcomes, which can actually lie in a collective realm of uh, we all as uh, human beings, right? And this is where we are referring to a term called citizen science. The proactive participation of citizen as an important stakeholder in research cannot be overemphasized in 21st century when the tools have become digital, when the methods have become so open and at the same time friendly, I would say, 
So it's important that such database collectively enriches the knowledge of sustainability, because that's how the future of cities, the future of urban and the future of settlements is going to take further. One of the last points is, is what I'm mentioning here is, is about tracking the scientific and societal impacts. Many a times, friends, we see the world is divided in the name of technology and society, but it is those who are able to connect the two perhaps are the way I think the future needs to look at. So here in, in context of this, I'm showing you very quickly just few snippets. I would agree that this would not suffice and do justice to the all entirety of sustainability. But just to seek a certain set of examples from my own country in context like India, uh, that what kind of projects are happening and how the non-governmental organizations are developing and working uh, practices which are informed by research. So it's kind of bringing a synergy between research and practice. So the three key directions that I'm trying to show you is one is domain of streets for inclusion. Second is safety in context of gender. And third is the context of developing standards for a particular country like India and what challenges that we go through and whether we can call them as success or something uh, close to that. So if you see uh, the, the whole complexity of practice, you know, the way we would like to see as, as a common human is the idea of systemic change, which is at the number six. <clears throat> But if you see where does it evolve for a researcher, it starts perhaps by identifying what is the true problem. Uh, is the problem having a collective democratic uh, understanding or do we all see the same problem differently? So it starts with prompts, which actually starts validating the problem itself, which is where it becomes more field oriented uh, approaches, which leads to development of proposals. And those proposals, as you understand, whether they seek funding or they seek approval to do certain interventions required to have the consent of the people in authority. Now it's important for us as urban planners, urban designers, architects, and whoever we think in the space of physicality of built environment, which impacts the sociability of the cultures also, it's important that we understand these stakeholders at these various levels. I'm here reminded of one Indian bureaucrat who, was, who has been known for a major set of transformation in Indian policies in education and in certain other ministries, his five key tenets of this approach are, he says, whenever you conceive a proposal and develop a project, please understand that it must be socially desirable, only then it becomes politically acceptable. The moment this is the first checkbox that you take, the next becomes important is that it becomes technologically feasible. Do we have the technologies to adapt and manage it within the given time and frame? And if that is true, then what about economic viability of the same project? And only when you cross this, there's the last stage, which is about the judicial tenability, which is about the legal rights of people, the society. And we hope you're not infringing upon all these. And these are things which cannot happen if we continue to practice in a silo-based thinking model and which is why many projects of the past could not succeed, which managed this silo approach. And this is what I think the peak of the call here is, that to, to kind of minimize the gap between research and practice, we need to look at this evolutionary cycle of collaboration, leading from proposals to smaller prototypes, wherein the concept of tactile urbanism as a method comes into picture. And then comes the issue of sustainability, wherein you need policy as a method to sustain. And once you succeed at one scale of project in an urban context, I would say then is the issue of scaling and multiplying it towards the angle of systemic change. In the same light, I'm actually, this is borrowed from the example of the transformation of streets in Chennai. And this is a perfect example for us to talk because it's now being talked globally. Chennai is the capital of Indian, South Indian state called Tamil Nadu, uh, where this exercise started many years ago. It's not very recent that the street transformation started with a small prompt, with a small stretch of 100 meters, 200 meters. And today it has become an example of non-motorized transformation for 100 kilometers. Because each step gave learnings, each step was researched, each step had technical components, each step had stakeholder participation, and each learning led to, so here I'm just giving you an example because we come from 
<clears throat> backgrounds of textual uh, research based analysis. So I'm also focusing a little bit on how visual methods of research and tools also enable that uh, the dimension of research for decision making. So here, if you see, it, it's it's a tool called basically field based drawings and to understand what really happens on a street. And there is an imagination with a driven logic, which is driven both by studies which are driven by empirical data, etc. And that is the transformation which looks in a very visual form. And this visual form becomes important because when you interface a lay person for a certain kind of understanding and their input, you need to provide the tools for participatory design as well. So this is what was done. And this is what is the outcome. That streets which were actually choked with traffic and parking, it required a policy-based intervention, but it also required a physical based intervention, which together has now transformed the entire space. So it's basically coming from those examples where the spaces have been <laughs> driven back from vehicles and the traffic and the noise to actually people and calling the human centric approach uh, possibility here. <clears throat> so in order to reflect further, this is coming from the same uh, ITDP, which is a well known international organization for <clears throat> transportation. Uh, it speaks that, you know, in the words of Henry Lefebvre, who we all understand as sociologists also, that, you know, these transformations are not about space, which is truly static. It's actually focusing on making spaces more alive and dynamic. So he's talking about, you know, when we are talking about these physical interventions in space through decisions of architecture, urban planning or design, the important point is that you have to understand the sociology of, of the whole context, and which, which we cannot do. <clears throat> unless we really interface and collaborate with the, with the groups of sociology towards these methods that we're talking about. Because treating space as an object would perhaps become an offense in practice if it does not respect the social context of that given place. And this is where the challenge comes in practices is the following of technocratic planning principles versus the realms of sociology. <laughs> But on the other side, these projects, which I'm rating as some degree of high success, <clears throat> also used uh, things like practical orientation. So when they were talking to stakeholders, they actually followed the three embedded principles, which guided these focus group discussions in the process of implementation, because this is about a street which was in a neighborhood <clears throat> and involved children's safety as, as an important part. Uh, so this guided basically this method as an approach guided practical orientation, provided bottom-up methodology instead of a top-down approach, and finally led to a deliberative solution generation, the outcome of which was the children's participation on the street. Of course, they may look like painting and brushes, but if you see the, the author of the same intervention, uh, Ashwati Dilip, who says that laying a new footpath may take about six months. However, these small scale, cheap and quick interventions showcase the impact that a design proposal can have on a space. Tactical urbanism initiatives have grown potentially across the world and cities are therefore experimenting these approaches for reclaiming those spaces. So the space which became unsafe is now a space for children to also play around and engage and build a new form of social communication <clears throat> as form of these implementations at the tactical urbanism. So likewise, I won't go detail into detail of this, but I'm just showing that how from one part of India, this gets extended to another part of India, which is the central part of the India, which is the capital, where the inclusion of streets uh, into a street zone like this, this is a pedestrian crossing, but you see there is no pedestrian space. And how do you manage a context like this? And this is the outcome of how tactical urbanism led to. Of course, I'm not going into the details of how this happened and the details, et cetera. But all these forms of practice that you're seeing, uh, reclaiming the land, reclaiming the ownerships of these spaces, leads us to an understanding that, that urbanism is also moving forward with open arms towards understanding the co-creation co of new research approaches, which can be jointly used into taking larger decisions for making our environments more sustainable. <clears throat> Likewise, the context and a new social challenge, if I can say so, is a challenge of gender safety issues, uh, whether it is in public zones, whether it is in streets, or even it could be a sociological issue uh, within our own communities and cultures. 
But very fact is what can an urban situation do and how can they handle when you see more and more crime cases coming up from women. So here is an example of, a, of an amazing NGO in India, which is called Safety Pin, which has now made a presence in large part of the global south, including, I'm told, uh, in Brazil, uh, where we are doing these projects with scientific methods of research involving both qualitative and quantitative approaches. And I'm just trying to say that how a sociological narrative of gender safety, when it is overlaid on the lens of an urban structure, it can lead to some very fundamental parametric data. And here you see, for example, this is a data of illumination of how in the streets, what illumination is considered safe and what is not considered safe and which could lead to certain decision makings, including intervention. And here, what I'm trying to say here is mapping as one tool, which has used digital. Second is the role of photographs as evidences. And third is correlational data as possible strategies for bringing people together. So not only these streets are mapped, this is an analysis from the streets of Gurgaon, which is a satellite town to New Delhi and is known as well known as for the IT city and IT infrastructure. But if you see the zones of streets and the information they communicate as an evidence towards the practitioners, I think it informs the design decisions much better, even planning decisions. And these are data where you find even this qualitative information could become quantitative only perhaps by the usage of certain research tools, the relevant scales, and mapping across genders, and which is what they have now given a digital name by the name called Safety Pin. Now, Safety Pin is also an app which on the back end can use the data analysis as a tool and algorithm, but can use your sociological interpretation using that data and technology. And it's, it's a beautiful team, I would say, which comprises, in fact, it is headed by a sociologist, but it has architects and urban planners and technocrats working as part of one single team, <clears throat> making these kind of transdisciplinary impacts across the world. So here you find on these parameters, you could really find whether it was sense of security an issue or a walkability as an issue or the non-availability of public transport. And this becomes important as empirical information to guide the future of urban <clears throat> realms. The last project that I'm quickly bringing here is the project in which I am myself involved as a consultant. And I'm just trying to bring it here, you know, for a country as large as ours, it's perhaps a great challenge to even define one term. What does accessibility mean? Does it mean the same in the rural context? Does it mean the same in a virtual context? So keeping this kind of domain slightly guided by the project itself, it was about looking at the needs of persons with disabilities as a larger need and looking at their inclusion as part of the building systems and urban planning systems. So as part of this, if you see also on the top are the partners. The partners are the UK government, uh, the Foreign Commonwealth and uh, Development Office, which developed this project called BASIC, which is building accessible, safe, sustainable, and inclusive cities. And you have this National Institute of Urban Affairs. You have Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, and I represent the IIT Roorkee as a technical knowledge partner to this whole organization which led to these kind of consultations across the country using digital tools, getting all this data across what their preferences were for cities. And here I'm bringing in a, a source from Professor Abir Malik's study on defining therefore sanitation standards using certain ethnographic tools. While we were not able to do this in our project, I'm just trying to bring in and connect that accessibility definition even for one particular space, a human space of a washroom, is not that easy. When you do these kind of studies, you realize even children's drawings were used as methods to analyze what they feel about a space and understand those things. These things led to experimental trials, which were actually physical trials of spatial experiments to understand the body level anthropometry, to look at design thinking as part of the whole process, leading to certain kind of interventions as standards uh, into a particular process. Many a times countries like ours are not able to fund such projects, but this leads us to an understanding of accessibility as a very holistic experience. And which is what now we have authored as part of the final guidelines, which are in, uh, in the draft phase now, that accessibility gets a re redefined perspective from shifting from a mere building plan to a complete process, wherein the processes require procurements and regulatory approvals, et cetera, as part of the whole thing. And leading to, if you see the whole complexity, 
this is the range of stakeholders that we had to work with in order to come up with a document which now looks like this uh, on its cover page. And the key representation here you see on a grid of nine is the transgender, the elderly, the children, people with vision impairments, et cetera, is the kind of direction. I wouldn't say this is not anything perfect, but these are approaches where research in a transdisciplinary background helps us take things into a forward mode. So looking at this and coming towards the concluding remarks, so what do we truly learn from these experiences and, and what theoretically things inform? So one thing we clearly understand is be it a discipline of urban planning, design or architecture, or be it even sociology, time has come that we cannot exist in a silo-based thinking model. It's greatly needed, at least as long as we are converging on goals of sustainability to be achieved. It really needs evidence as an implication backed by intense theory backed by intense uh, social logic sometimes and backed by contextualization which can only happen if we collaborate and co-research together. <clears throat> the second aspect here is about the factors driven by normative methodologies versus empirical evidence. I would definitely prefer that never should a word called versus come into picture. It's contextualization of methods and that's where mixed method approaches bring us more together into taking these aspects further. And the last point that we say here is whether we use new phrases and new isms from sustainabilism to walkability to smartness and green cities, I think we all know that urban futures are inevitable. But for those urban futures to sustain along with humans like us, it's important in times now that transdisciplinary approaches become a norm rather than still a segregated view. And I think if you have to take anything from this lecture, I can reduce the burden is just two letters, CO. If you just remember the word co, you will remember that all complexities require collective approach, also require co-researching. And only then we can base the premise of collaborative. Unfortunately, but I'm giving you a sad example, even the word COVID started with co but it brought the world together in a different way towards looking at shrinking boundaries. And perhaps we are all co-watching this experience today in Botswana through this conference, only because we have been able to co-share co this opportunity of learning in this. So towards the end, I would highlight again what the earlier favorite urban designer, Jane Jacobs talked about, but was not very much heard by even American urbanists of those times was, that cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. And we cannot involve everybody unless we know the methods of involving them. And that's where the role of sociologists, anthropologists, ethnographers, architects, planners, technocrats, everybody, I would say even anonymous laymen has a huge contribution to play a role. And it's for us to learn how can we allow and let everyone be included as a larger goal of sustainability. So in our words, I jointly thank along with Professor Ingela, everyone for a very patient listening. And maybe I take this opportunity to use a German word of Danke to uh, express uh, the warmth and thanks to all of you for this opportunity to deliver uh, this address. Thank you so much.